Hello once again and thanks for joining us for Friday's edition of Alaska Weather. And up first, we've got uh, satellite imagery showing low pressure spinning near the Seward Peninsula, keeping it cloudy there down across Norton Sound and much of the southwest interior, although seeing some partly sunny skies breaking out over Bristol Bay. As you can see, back toward the Pribilof Islands and the west-northwest Bering Sea, seeing a fair amount of clearing. That extends eastward there across the Alaska Peninsula and the Kodiak Island. And uh, band of clouds and showers and rain moving northeastward and ending from southwest to northeast there. Still lingering over northern Cook Inlet at picture time, but a lot of sunshine breaking out down just south of Anchorage into the western Kenai Peninsula, back down toward Kachemak, Kamishak Bays, Kodiak Island, mostly sunny. But uh, rainfall, the heavier rainfall now shifting eastward, brought a quarter of an inch to, uh, or one and a quarter inches to Cordova. And Yakutat's picked up about an inch and a half of rain over the last 24 hours with rainfall across much of uh, interior Alaska over the last 24 hours from just a few hundredths to uh, a third or more of an inch of precipitation extends all the way up toward the Arctic coast and moving into the northern panhandle there's drier conditions down over the southern southeast coast and out to the west you can see a lot of clouds with the next system that's bringing rain and increasing winds a little bit more of an increased rain than wind situation into the western Aleutians there and another band weak band there spreading some clouds and maybe a few showers into the eastern Aleutians otherwise uh, you can see the old low there spinning uh, right uh, near the Bering Strait or just to the east there over the Seward Peninsula. Slowly weakening, winds not as strong today as they were yesterday or even early last night, but still keeping it uh, pretty showery and cloudy and cool uh, over that area there. And actually cool temperatures across all of mainland Alaska into the Panhandle today, uh, mostly in the 50s and some 60s showing up. Uh, but uh, as of mid-afternoon, no 70-degree readings popping up at all. On the chart, a lot of clouds, showers, and rain across interior Alaska today, right down to the North Gulf Coast. And again, that ending over uh, Cook Inlet with sunshine breaking out, uh, Kodiak Island, southern Cook Inlet, and into Bristol Bay and the Alaska Peninsula there. And then a weak band bringing a little bit of moisture into the uh, eastern Aleutians there, but not much at all. The more significant system back to the west over the central and western Aleutians with uh, rain and fog there. Winds uh, really haven't kicked up much uh, with that system, lack of a gradient there. And showers and rain over the northern panhandle. And again, moderate amounts of rain starting to let up now as that system moves eastward uh, over the eastern North Gulf coastal areas. And for tonight, uh, trough keeps uh, showers, rain, fog, drizzle, or uh, one or the three or four there going uh, tonight into the Brooks Range or becomes more isolated and uh, scattered. Otherwise dry over the interior, dry Cook Inlet with some clearing, Kenai Peninsula, and increasing clouds for Kodiak Island later tonight. Otherwise a light wind, dry evening, and most of the overnight period coming up there as well as for Bristol Bay. Partly uh, cloudy skies for the Purple Off Islands. Rain with that system. First low moving to the uh, eastern Aleutians or just south of the eastern Aleutians, bringing uh, increasing wind and rain to the Alaska Peninsula. Now pushing up towards Sitkanak Island late tonight, but probably won't make landfall there until t early tomorrow morning. Otherwise, that trough sliding into the panhandle, left over from that uh, heavier rainfall front uh, for the North Gulf Coast today, that uh, spreads rain fog and drizzle over much of the area or showers uh, from Dixon entrance all the way up to Skagway and Haines tonight. Showers slowly diminish over the southeast interior and also precipitation starting to fade away there with that uh, weakening low near the Seward Peninsula into Norton Sound. And for tomorrow, it doesn't, the showers keep uh, fairly entrenched there from the northwest coast with that low. It doesn't, just won't go away completely and neither were the showers and clouds with it and the cool temperatures remain at least through Saturday up in that area down to the coastal areas of the Yukon Delta not nearly as widespread or as heavy as it has been winds not a factor at all with that weak low wind and rain moderate possibly heavy at times there for Kodiak Islands pushing up into southern Cook Inlet later in the afternoon Kamishak, Kachemak Bays maybe as far north as Anchor Point with showers 
uh, kind of uh, developing throughout the day in western Prince William Sound and down toward Resurrection Bay and Seward, but it could be a partly sunny, at least start to the day for South Central Alaska, northern Cook Inlet, Manuska, Sitna Valley, much as of the southern mainland there with just some isolated showers over the Alaska Range and up around the Eagle area. Otherwise dry over much of mainland Alaska, some rain or snow showers for the eastern Arctic coast that'll extend down into the eastern Brooks Range, but nothing really heavy there. And still showery with the remnants of a trough. Uh, again, the, most of the showers or the heaviest shower activity will be over the central and northern southeast coast. Risk of showers for Yakutat, otherwise the north Gulf Coast, looking at a much drier day Saturday than what you saw today. And then back into the rain, first uh, slug of moisture moves in and brings rain across south central Alaska Saturday night. Cook Inlet, Kenai Peninsula, even the Manusa sit in the valley. And then that moves eastward during the early morning hours and into the afternoon ending again, becoming a dry afternoon for Cook Inlet and the Susitna Valley, as well as the Kuskokwim Valley as well. The interior looking dry, partly to mostly sunny. Periods of rain, Copper River Basin, eastern North Gulf Coast, and a fairly good slug of moisture will bring some moderate to possibly briefly heavy rains into the central and southern coast of the Panhandle. Next big storm bringing gale and storm force winds with it up into the southeast Bering Sea with uh, more rain into Bristol Bay. Higher pressure out west uh, making for light winds and clearing skies. Lows tonight uh, mid to upper 30s for the Arctic coast once again and part of the North Slope otherwise in the 40s much of interior Alaska everybody in the 40s lower to mid 40s out west and mid 40s for the Copper River Basin 45 to 50 south central Alaska. Upper 40s near 50 for the Alaska Peninsula, lower 50s again for the Panhandle. Highs tomorrow, upper 50s to lower 60s for the southeast coast, and the cool, chilly lower to mid 60s for interior Alaska, and upper 50s to lower 60s for south central Alaska, mid 50s for Kodiak Island, lower 50s out in the Bering Sea and the Aleutians with uh, 40s along the Arctic coast. Lows, mid to upper 30s again for the Arctic coast, otherwise in the 40s, lower to mid, most interior Alaska areas, they're down to 40 for Eagle and uh, 42 for Gamble, otherwise lower 50s again for the Panhandle and lower to mid 40s for uh, South Central Alaska, but near 50 for Kodiak and Homer, Seldovia, as well as lower 50s for the Alaska Peninsula, otherwise mid 40s for the Privlos, lower 40s for St. Lawrence Island, and then following uh, sun, or highs for Sunday afternoon. Finally, some areas showing into this with more sunshine looking into the 70s there. Fairbanks high, forecast high about 70, which is uh, a little closer to normal now for their uh, average high temperature for this time of year. Lower 70s up in the Yukon Flats and uh, lower 70s also for Eagle down toward Northway and Toke. Otherwise, different story for the Panhandle, still stuck in the upper 50s to lower 60s, and maybe 60 to 65. So Sitna Valley, Talkeetna, Big Lake could push up into the upper 60s, but uh, 63 all the way down to Homer. Upper 50s, lower 60s, Bristol Bay, and near 40 for the Central Arctic Coast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Flying weather, IFR Arctic Coast, marginal VFR North Slope in the Brooks Range with a swath of VFR from the Northwest Coast across the Kobuk Koyukuk Valley into the Yukon Flats. Marginal VFR, Tanana Valley, Alaska Range down into the Copper River Basin North Gulf Coast, Cook Inlet and part of the Susitna Valley, VFR down to Kodiak Island. Areas of IFR for the Alaska Peninsula and the Aleutians, mostly marginal for the Bering Sea. IFR St. Lawrence Island, Norton Sound, and the Seward Peninsula. Solid IFR there for Yakutat and most of the southeast coast. And moving on to the afternoon, marginal VFR, uh, most of the panhandle, although breaking out the VFR for Lincoln Isle Glacier Bay. North Gulf Coast uh, improving as that next system begins to approach, kind of calm before the storm. And IFR spreading up into Southern Cook Inlet late in the day in Kachemak Bay. Extending back across Bristol Bay, the Alaska Peninsula, areas of IFR for the Aleutians, and areas of IFR, areas of marginal VFR, and areas of VFR for the Bering Sea. IFR, eastern Arctic coast, north slope, eastern Brooks Range. Pretty good in, uh, VFR, interior Alaska. And for the uh, morning, Sunday, IFR, southeast coast, Gulf of Alaska, north Gulf Coast, Prince William Sound, Back to Kodiak Island, Southern Cook Inlet, uh, IFR, 
Northern Cook Inlet, Marginal VFR, Marginal VFR up to the Alaska Range, and to the north and northwest of the mountains there, VFR from the southwest coast right up both the Kuskokwim and Yukon River Valleys into the Tanana Valley to the Brooks Range, good VFR, but the Kobuk Valley, Selawik to Kotzebue, marginal, some IFR for the North Slope and Eastern Arctic Coast, IFR for the Western Seward Peninsula, Bering Strait Coast, down to Gamble, another area of IFR there from ADAC eastward to the Alaska Peninsula. And for the afternoon, uh, looks like the Aleutians will be IFR, and then a branch of that extends northeastward from Atka Island across the Pribilofs, Nunavak Island right into the southwest interior, then angles back southeastward across the Kuskokwim Valley into Kodiak Island. Marginal VFR, Southern Alaska, Central Alaska VFR, Brooks Range out to the Arctic coast, IFR with marginal VFR. And it looks like uh, some IFR there for the uh, northern part of the southeast coast, otherwise widespread marginal VFR. And for Anatuvik tomorrow, look uh, like looks like a marginal VFR day there Saturday as well as Adigan, mostly marginal. Lake Clark and Merrill, occasional marginal VFR throughout the day. And for Rainy, mostly marginal. Could be some periods of VFR as well though. And for Windy, same thing, possible marginal VFR at times with VFR at other times. Isabel, marginal VFR turning toward VFR in the afternoon. <clears throat> And Mentasta, optimistically, call it a VFR day there, either approach, Tanita, marginal VFR, improving to VFR, afternoon into the evening. And for Portage, marginal VFR with some uh, trap moisture there, possibly keeping it IFR on the uh, Whittier side, Passage Canal side, eastern entrance. And for Chilkoot and White, uh, starting out IFR, but improving to marginal VFR, possibly becoming VFR late in the afternoon into tomorrow evening. Freezing levels, uh, cold pool over the northern Bering Sea into the western interior with the coldest air aloft right over the yukon Kuskokwim Delta, Norton Sound at about 4,000 feet or three to 4,000 feet. But a, quite a gradient there, the southern Bering Sea sloping up 12,000 feet for the eastern Aleutians and about uh, eight to 10,000 feet over the Panhandle. Icing, areas of uh, isolated, moderate, or mixed rime icing over the uh, mostly the central and northern interior, northern Bering Sea areas with uh, less of a chance of icing south to, to the south. Panhandle should be icing free as well as southern Alaska. And the Aleutians, jet stream, uh, west, westerly flows 70 knots out over the Bering Sea. Turn southwest 80 to 90 knots and then back to westerly there over the uh, Tanana Valley in 40 mile country and 105 knot jet just clipping the northern panhandle west 85 knots across Kodiak Island. And at 9,000 feet, uh, low pressure near Togiak Bay, southwest flow on the south side of that 40 to 60 knots south of the forecast area though, but cutting into the southern southeast coast 9,000 feet or 3,000 feet southeast 45 knots across southern Cook Inlet and Kachemak Bay. Turbulence, moderate chop for southern Cook Inlet, Kodiak, and parts of the Alaska Peninsula. NOAA operates three types of satellite systems for the United States polar orbiting satellites, geostationary satellites, and a deep space satellite. Polar orbiting satellites circle the Earth and provide global information from 540 miles above the surface. Geostationary satellites constantly monitor the Western Hemisphere from 22,240 miles above the Earth. And our deep space satellite orbits 1 million miles from Earth, providing space weather alerts and forecasts, while also monitoring the amount of solar energy absorbed by Earth every day. While NOAA operates many satellites, no one country alone can afford to effectively monitor the entire Earth. NOAA partners with the international community to leverage data from satellites around the world, providing a more complete understanding of our ever-changing planet. A wildfire is born, and teams of people leap into action sounding the alarm for nearby residents, providing local fire observations, and getting ready to battle the flames from ground and sky. These frontline responders do the heavy lifting when it comes to fighting and managing fires, but they're often helped by the view from higher up. From late spring to early fall, 
Two U.S. Forest Service planes flying at 10,000 feet crisscross the western United States chasing fires, sometimes mapping dozens of fires in one night. They help identify a fire's perimeter and any outlying fires or hotspots, and provide information to the fire management teams on the ground. Meanwhile, further above, NASA and NOAA satellites provide a powerful global view of active fires across the entire planet. Satellites can fill in the gaps between ground and airborne observations, identifying fires soon after they start, and detecting fires that nothing else can, like in remote stretches of wilderness, or estimating a fire's perimeter when planes aren't available. These fire observations from air and space can help responders decide where to send firefighters and other resources. Three, two, one, main engine start and lift off of the Atlas rocket with Terra. And since NASA designed and launched the first satellite instruments to specifically measure fires 20 years ago, satellite fire data has also been used in many other ways, including detecting smoke plumes, forecasting and measuring air quality downwind from a fire, measuring burned area after fires are extinguished, and looking at trends in global fire frequency and severity. NASA and NOAA scientists are working to leverage that satellite data with new airborne field campaigns featuring new technologies for measuring wildfires so that we can all make better decisions about how to respond when fire strikes. The reason that we as humans care about climate change is that it affects not just the temperature, but a whole bunch of other things that we care about. It affects soil moisture, which in turn affects our ability to grow the things that we eat. It affects cloud cover. It affects rainfall patterns. It increases drought risk in some regions and decreases it in other regions. Understanding our changing climate on a planet with incredibly complex and interconnected systems is a massive scientific undertaking. And climate scientists like Kate Marvel are using the data collected by satellites from around the world to improve the power of climate models. If we want to make better decisions about where we live, understand the changing impacts of hurricanes, or improve predictions of fire seasons, we need evolving climate models. We don't have any observations from the year 2050, from the year 2100, but we can use our best knowledge of physics and chemistry and how the Earth system works in order to look at the impact of different emissions trajectories, different policy scenarios. Climate models provide a view into our future, from our globe to our own communities. As models advance, as they're tasked with predicting the, the nature of the weather and the clouds over smaller and smaller scales, they're being asked tougher questions like, well, what kind of clouds are happening over those small scales and how often and how heavily are they raining? We expect roughly on really, really large scales, climate change is making wet regions wetter and dry regions drier. But at the same time, it's shifting the circulation of the atmosphere. So the locations on a very, very large scale of those wet and dry regions are changing. Climate models are composed of lots of different calculations on the different behaviors of our atmosphere, our land, and our oceans. To accurately represent the natural world, they need massive amounts of satellite data over decades from NASA's Earth Observation Fleet and its partners around the world. Satellites like the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission provide valuable rainfall data on daily to seasonal timescales for the past 20 years. And it's that information, along with a suite of other data, that go into climate model development. Currently, GPM microimager radiance data are used to generate initial states of NASA climate models and to guide climate model solutions to be close to real states by applying data assimilation techniques. Data assimilation is the process of combining many different sources of Earth observations into models to improve how we represent the Earth system. Uh, assimilating uh, GPM microwave imager uh, data uh, improved intensity and locations of storms and precipitation calculated by the climate models. And once a climate model is developed, 
It's tested over and over because, well... All models are wrong, but some models are useful. So they're always going to be un incomplete. They're always going to be a not exact representation of the real world. But we want to make sure that they are capturing important aspects of the Earth so that we, we can treat them as credible going forward. Typically what happens is when you modify one part of the, the climate model, other parts accidentally change. It's kind of like the whack-a-mole game. By hitting it down, we're improving it, we're, we're killing the air, we're decreasing the problem uh, existing in the model, but another area pops up. And that is why NASA observations of the Earth from space, the air, and the ground are critical to understanding how our Earth system works. Observations help improve the modeling for our future here on Earth with new capabilities to expand our knowledge. NASA is launching satellites and coordinating missions like GPM, giving us that long-term, really accurate satellite record of what's been going on, not just of the temperature rising, but of various aspects of the climate changing. So precipitation and cloud cover and soil moisture and a whole bunch of different climate variables that people care about. Continuing key observations of the Earth is really important to see how our atmosphere, land, and oceans are changing over time. A long-term record combined with cutting-edge observations from the new NASA Earth System Observatory will continue to push boundaries to better understand our ever-changing Earth. And now, Marine weather around Alaska. Moving on to marine forecast of the south coast of the Panhandle. West-southwest winds for the day Saturday, 10 to 15 knots. North coast, anywhere from west to southeast at 10 to 15 knots with seas 5 feet. And for Lynn Canal, southeast winds 10 knots. Stevens Passage, southeast winds 10 knots. And for Clarence Strait, south winds at 10 knots. And for the day Sunday, Small craft advisories for Lynn Canal, south winds 25 knots with uh, five foot seas. Small craft advisories also out for Clarence Strait, south winds 25 knots and southeast winds at 20 knots for Stevens Passage. Stronger winds along the coast with small craft advisories out for the south coast, uh, south to southwest 25 to 30 knots, south to southeast winds 30 knots for the north coast with seas as high as 12 feet. And for Cook Inlet, southeast winds 10 knots, seas 2 feet. Prince William Sound, southeast winds 10 knots, 2 foot seas. Variable winds at 20 knots with 4 foot seas for the North Gulf Coast. And small craft advisories for both the Barren Islands and Kamishak Bay. Winds expected to be from the southeast at 25 knots. And for the day Sunday, gale warnings for the North Gulf Coast. East northeast winds 35 knots, seas anywhere from 10 to 14 feet. Gale warnings also for the Barren Islands. East winds 35 knots with 10 foot seas. Small craft advisories, Kamishak Bay, east winds 25 knots. Southern Cook Inlet, small craft advisories, north winds at 25 knots. Prince William Sound, northern Cook Inlet, looking at a northeast wind at about 20 knots on Sunday with seas 3 to 4 feet. Kodiak Island, small craft advisories Saturday. East winds 25 to 30 knots. The Alaska Peninsula, Southeast and northeast winds at 20 knots, and Bristol Bay east winds at 20 knots with four foot seas. And then a big increase in the winds for these areas on Sunday with that next strong storm moving northeastward to the west of the area. We've got storm warnings out for the uh, Bering Sea side of the Alaska Peninsula for south winds at 50 knots with seas building to 13 feet. Gale warnings for the Pacific side from Cape Sarachev to Castle Cape, south winds 35 knots. Gale warnings for Bristol Bay, southeast winds 40 knots. Small craft advisors for Kodiak Island for 25 to 30 knot winds. For the eastern Aleutians, Saturday, north to northeast winds 15 to 20 knots. And northeast up to 20 for the central Aleutians. And for the western Aleutians, looking at northeast winds 20 to 25 knots, seas 6 to 7 feet. <clears throat> and for Sunday, for the eastern Aleutians, gale warnings. West to southwest winds 35 to 45 knots with seas 15 to 17 feet. Gale warnings for the central Aleutians, northwest at 35 there with 10 to 15 foot seas. And then western Aleutians, lighter winds out of the northwest at 20 to 25 knots. For the Pribilofs on Saturday, northeast winds 15 knots, east winds 20 knots for the Cuscombe Delta Coast, light variable winds for the Yukon Delta Coast and St. Matthew Island, southwest at 20 for St. Lawrence Island. 
And for Sunday, storm warnings for the Perbolovs. North winds 50 knots. East winds 50 knots for the Kuskokwim Delta. North winds 35 knots for the Northern Bering Sea. And good gales for the Yukon Delta coast. Out of the northeast of 40 knots. North 15 for St. Lawrence Island. And for Saturday for the Arctic coast. Pretty uniform both wind and sea height wise. Northeast of 20, seas 3 to 4 feet. And east winds at 20 knots from Wales to Cape Thompson with 4 foot seas. And for the day Sunday, for the central and western Arctic coast southward to Wales, look for northeast winds at 20 knots with 3 to 5 foot seas. For the eastern Boulevard Sea coast, uh, winds will be east at 15 with 2 foot seas in the ice free waters. For tonight, look for areas of light rain, fog, drizzle, or showers for the Arctic coast and north slope into the Brooks Range where it becomes more isolated. Dry over the central interior, diminishing showers over the Alaska Range and southeast part of the state. Kind of damp and unsettled for the Panhandle. Next system spreads wind and rain into the eastern Aleutians and Alaska Peninsula overnight tonight. And that pushes northeastward tomorrow with uh, rain moderate to briefly heavy at times for Kodiak Island with increasing winds. Not a bad day, dry with some sunshine in south central Alaska in the interior, showery over the Panhandle, and continued showery Norton Sound to Kotzebue on the northwest coast. And for Sunday, strong low pressure brings the storm and gale force winds into the southeast Bering and Bristol Bay area, Alaska Peninsula and the, Purbl and the uh, Kodiak Island area. Another trough uh, keeps it wet from the North Gulf Coast, Prince William Sound, and the Copper River Basin, with moderate amounts of rain sliding into the southern coast of the uh, Panhandle. Otherwise, high pressure builds into the western Bering Sea and Aleutians. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. <laughs>